welcome everybody. Welcome to this uh, last session of the YRS. And we start with the uh, last installment of the Hugo de Mille-Copin's mini course. So, Hugo, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so today I want to focus on the application of the Edward Sokal coupling. And I realized I took a little bit more time than I expected, but I'm going to try to still do it at the right speed. So maybe I will tell you a little bit less about the Baxter Vu uh, connection just after. I will still have time, I think, to, to uh, present it, but maybe I will skip the application. Just to remind you of on where we finished yesterday. So we wanted to prove that the critical point of uh, the POTS model is equal to Q minus one over Q times log of one per square root Q. POTS model on the square lattice. And it was asked and uh, I, I want to insist that we work on the square lattice. And just after that, I told you that I'm going to use in order to predict what the critical point is, I'm going to use a connection, a duality connection, in the fortune in the FK percolation, which is not apparent at first sight, at least in the POTS model. And this duality is defined as follows: you take your original graph, let's say a piece of the square lattice in white, and you consider the dual graph, which I uh, denoted in, in dash on this picture where you do the following, you take the set of edges of your graph G and you take the dual edges associated to them, which are the edges which are cutting them in, the, in their center. So this gives you the set of edges E star of G star and the set of vertices is simply the endpoints of your edges. So this is G star. And my point yesterday was that if you start with a configuration on the original graph, then there is a natural configuration on the dual graph, which simply consists in defining omega star of E star to be one minus omega E, which here corresponds to the following. If you depict the edges of omega in green, then the edges of omega, so the edges for which omega E is one, then the edges of the dual graph are gonna be the following. So here, for instance, this edge is in omega, so I do not put the dual edge, but this edge is not in omega, so I put the dual edge in it. Same thing here, and I draw all the dual edges, which if you want are not crossing an edge of omega. So this gives me omega star, okay? Is it clear the way you get from omega to omega star? I mean, it's a rhetorical question because and you, you don't have a microphone. But, um, and then once you define like this, you have a duality relation, which says the following. It says that if omega is a FK percolation with parameter P and Q on G, then omega star is also FK percolation, which is not at all obvious at first sight. It's also an FK percolation. It just has different parameters, and these parameters are P star and Q stars, Q star is in fact Q, and P star satisfies this relation. By the way, it's a duality because if you reapply, in some sense, if you apply twice the procedure, you end up on the original model. Let me just, for people that would be a little bit confused by this claim, let me do a special, before I, I actually prove it, let me give you a special case. So when Q equals one, Then, of course, Q star is also equal to one, but P star takes a very easy form. P, P star over one minus P, one minus P star equal one, just gives you P star equal one minus P. So what this proposition claims in this very specific case is something very easy to see, which is that if you start from Bernoulli percolation, remember, it's just a model where you toss a coin independently for every edge, and every edge is open with pro ATP, then the dual configuration is also a Bernoulli percolation of parameter one minus P. But this is completely obvious because it's just for every edge, 
you just do the reverse procedure, which is if it's tail, you put uh, the guy, and if it's face, you don't put it. So of course, it's, uh, you put the edge with probability one minus p, and you don't put it with probability p independently of the other edges. So this is a specific case, and it's an easy case. Just before I prove that, I don't know if you thought about where this thing is coming from. I'm not going to write it. I'm going to write it when I would do the proof. But it comes from the following. Here, when you see a duality relation, one of the first things you want to look at, usually, is what are the things that are self-dual. And here, if you take p equal p star, you end up with p equal square root q over 1 plus square root q. And when you plug it in the formula, you remember beta c is equal to minus q minus 1 over q log of 1 minus p. You, if you take this self-dual point p, you end up with this. So the go-home message of this application will be that in order to predict the critical point of the POTS model, you transfer to FK percolation, and there, there is a very special point, which is a self-dual point, and this point corresponds to the critical point. Okay? Okay, so now let's, let's actually prove these two things. So let's start with the duality. So it's not going to be very difficult. Let's start with the expression for the probability of omega, which is going to be the probability of omega star. It's a bijection between the two. But what I want is to be expressing this thing in terms of omega star. So if I start, I get 1 over z, p to the number of open edges. You remember there was a 1 minus p to the number of edges which are not in omega, and q to the k of omega. So first transformation, I'm going to write it as p over 1 minus p to the number of edges. I just, what I did is that the 1 minus p to the e, I just put it in the renormalization constant. And then I'm going to change q to the k of omega in the following way. I'm going to use that k of omega if I look at the connected component of my original graph, well, it's in fact corresponding to the faces of my dual graph if I think of all these exterior guys as being connected. So if I think that all these guys are connected, then the connected component of my original graph are exactly the faces of the dual one. So this is going to be the faces of the graph omega star when I think everybody is connected, which I can reinterpret as omega star one. You remember I was saying everybody on the boundary is identified. It's exactly what I did. All the points on the boundary, I identified them. And now, if I use Euler formula for planar graph, I end up with the following. This is, in fact, equal to the connected component of omega star plus, so I'm always with plus minuses, it's difficult, so plus the number of edges in omega star minus the number of vertices in omega star plus 1. This is the classical Euler formula for planar graphs. So if I replug that here, I end up with number of connected components in omega star, plus number of vertices in omega star, minus number, uh, sorry, plus number of edges, minus number of vertices, plus one. Okay, so I just use this observation that connected component are faces, and I use Euler formula. Once I'm there, it looks already quite good. Why? Because the number of edges of my graph, maybe I could also make the transformation here. So the number of edges of my graph, it's also just number of edges that are not in omega star, meaning it's equal to this. So, overall, what do I do now? If I rechange the, the, the 
the, sorry, the <laughs> renormalization constant by removing the p over 1 minus p to the e star and the q to the minus v star plus 1, which are constant, I just end up with p, I mean, 1 minus p over p times q to the number of edges in omega star times q to the number of connected components in omega star 1. Okay? So all the constants I plug in in, uh, in z, and I end up with this. But now, this, this thing, I can use my formula for p, p star. If I use this here, I'm going to end up with p star over 1 minus p star to the number of edges in omega star times q to the number of connected components in omega star. And if I do exactly the same trick as going here, I recover 1 over z triple prime times p star to the omega star, 1 minus p star to the e star minus omega star, and q to the number of connected components in omega star 1. So overall, To prove this, we only need this observation between the phases and the connected components and a Euler formula. Okay? So, probability of omega, which is the probability of omega star, is equal to this, which is exactly the FK uh, measure. Okay. Now let's dive into the proof of our theorem. And here, I must confess, we are only going to sketch it. But I want to be, I'm basically going to skip the whole difficulty, but I'm going to be able to illustrate at least why it's, it's what it should be. So, remember that M of beta Q, so the magnetization, was related to the probability of zero, uh, sorry, did I say that? I don't remember, no, I didn't say, sorry. So I defined M of beta Q, which remember is mu Z2 beta tau of sigma zero scalar product with tau. And this is just the limit when G is tending to Z2 of mu tau G beta of sigma zero tau, okay? But this, remember, by the Edward Sokal coupling, this is the limit when G tends to Z2 of the probability GP of zero connected to the boundary of G. This was the application of the Edward Sokal coupling with wired boundary conditions. Now, this measure here, when G tends to Z2, is converging to the probability of, um, I mean, the probability measure on Z2. Uh, by the way, here it's with P, so with beta equal minus Q minus 1 over Q, log 1 minus P. So this measure is converging when G is tending to Z2, to the probability on Z2. And if I take G to Z2, Z connected to the boundary of G is going to converge to simply Z connected to infinity, if you want, meaning Z being in an infinite connected component. So this limit is equal to P1, Z2P of zero connected to infinity. So what do I need to prove? So overall, we need to prove Well, if I want to have that the magnetization is strictly positive when beta is larger than Q minus 1 over Q log of 1 plus square root Q, and if you want to prove that it's zero below it, in fact, what you need to prove is that the probability Z2P Q 1 of zero connected to infinity is zero if P is smaller than square root Q over 1 plus square root Q, 
and it's strictly positive if p is larger than square root q over 1 plus square root q. If you prove that and you use this relation, you end up with what we want. Okay? So how do I prove this? Well, let me do something a little bit funny and look at the following event. So first of all, I'm going to define P self-dual. I should have done it maybe before that, which is square root Q over 1 plus square root Q. So it's exactly the guy which is self-dual. Actually, let me rewrite it. It's going to be nicer like that. By the way, a physicist, as soon as there is a duality, would actually tell you that the only possibility for the critical point will be this self-dual point for the following reason, that he will say there is only one phase transition in your system. I mean, this is not obvious, but you can predict that. And if there is only one, then if it was as a parameter P, which is not self-dual, then by duality, there would be another phase transition at P star. And that looks bad. Okay? So the only reasonable prediction is that the phase transition happens exactly at the self-dual point because there it's not contradictory because P star is equal to P. So here we are going to make rigorous in some sense this, this thing because it's not obvious that there is a unique phase transition. So uh, you need to prove it. Okay, so we introduce this thing and let's look at the following. By the way, Maybe just to simplify our life, this thing, I'm going to call it P now, okay, just for the parameter. And I'm going to ignore something which you are not allowed to ignore normally, which is that there are boundary conditions. I'm going to ignore that and simply work with some kind of unique measure P, which if you are at the safe dual point, then the dual of this measure is also the measure itself. This is not true in general, but let's, let's assume that. So I define P, which is P, Z2, 1, P self dual, Q, and I'm going to ignore the boundary condition and assume that P star is equal to P, that the dual of this measure is the same. By the way, if it was not the case, then it's very easy to conclude. So this is not a big assumption. So let's assume that. So now if you assume that, question for you, again rhetorical, but I'm going to leave you a little bit of time to think about it. By little bit, it's going to be 10 seconds, so be ready. What is the probability that in omega, there is a path from left to right so from this side to this side in, in the rectangle. Can I estimate this probability? Well, in order maybe to guess what it is, what you can say is that you can look at what is the dual event of this, uh, the complementary event. So if there isn't any path from left to right, that means that there is a blocking path in the dual configuration that prevents the existence of the path from left to right. And this blocking path, if you think about it, it lives in a rotated version of my rectangle like that. And I need to have my pass like that blocking in omega star. But now, if you assume that P equals P star, so if you assume that omega star has the same law as omega, here you notice that I just work with a rotated version of my original event, so the two events have the same probability. If they have the same probability, it must be that it is one half. So the probability of crossing like that a rectangle is one half at criticality, uh, at uh, the self-dual point. Okay, but now define F 
of Pn to be the probability of crossing the rectangle, but when I look at the measure with a parameter p. So I know that f of one of p self dual n, so if I, I, I draw this, if I look at p self dual, I know that f is exactly at one half. Right? That's what I just proved. But what I claim is that this f of pn, and this is where things are not obvious at all, f of pn is going to undergo what we call a sharp threshold, meaning that this f of pn has a lot of difficulty to stay between 0 and 1. It wants to be either very close to 0 or very close to 1, in the sense that if I draw the graph of this function, it's going to look like that. I don't think I will ever draw something better than that. Okay, good. <laughs> so it's going to undergo a sharp threshold in the sense that if I look at, I don't know, the time it spends between epsilon and 1 minus epsilon, then the window here is going to be tiny. And in fact, it's going to get tinier and tinier when n goes to infinity. So, sorry, I have a naive question. So yeah. uh, last time you explained to us that this derivative at uh, one half is uh, at, at the critical point is very, very big, right? Yeah. But I think it, at least naively, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it will reach almost up to one and up to zero. It may be very sharp, but still. Exactly. You are right. You are right. This is, I mean, this thing, so the sharp threshold is the whole gist of the argument, and it took 40 years to come up with it. So, so proving the sharp threshold is difficult. Is, in some sense, the whole difficulty of the, of the argument. So that's exactly what I'm not going to prove to you. So I agree that this is maybe frustrating, but I promise it's, it's good for you. <laughs> I'm thinking about you by doing that. Um, but let me just mention keywords. What is funny is that at least the original proof of this, uh, our proof of this, this thing, of the fact that you have a sharp threshold. Uh, of course, I mean, the window is smaller and smaller when n goes to infinity. That's what is going to be important. So the proof of this is really based on analysis of this function as a Boolean function, meaning uh, uh, more as the average of a Boolean function. It's a function that takes 0 and 1 as inputs and speed 0 and 1 for the indicator of this event, and you just average this thing. And there is actually a very rich theory of discrete analysis, which is devoted to understanding the averages of Boolean functions. And you have beautiful things using discrete Fourier analysis, and you have very generic results on sharp thresholds. For instance, functions, Boolean functions that are sufficiently symmetric they naturally undergo a sharp threshold. So there is a whole game of trying to make this uh, f a function that will be very symmetric in its entries, that every edge is basically playing the same role, which is not at all the case here. I mean, of course, an edge here is influencing the outcome much less than an edge in the middle. But you can try to play, and that's the whole proof, to play to try to use this generic result for, for Boolean functions. Okay? So we are going to assume that and try to see what we can do with it. So the outcome of this is actually a very, very strong outcome. I'm going to keep this picture there. So the outcome is that f of pn is going to be smaller than exponential of minus a constant depending on p times n for p smaller than p self-dual. And it's going to be larger than 1 minus exponential 
of minus a constant of p times n for p larger than p self dual. So it's an extremely sharp threshold. And once you are here, I promise it's very easy to prove that, uh, that in fact for p smaller than pc you cannot have an infinite connected component and for p larger than pc you must have one. Just on the picture it kind of looks very, very convincing because imagine that you would have an infinite connected component then it's very difficult to believe that this infinite connected component would cross a large rectangle with probability which is exponentially small. You rather believe that this huge connected component will actually cross the, the rectangle with good probability. And on the other hand, if you have a, such a, a, a high probability to cross a rectangle, it's not that difficult to believe that then you should be able to combine crossings in different rectangles to actually create an infinite connected uh, component with positive probability. So here I realize, of course, that I'm not providing a full proof. This, I, I promise you, it will not be a full proof. But I wanted to mention first the rewriting in terms of the self-dual thing. Then this observation that something special happens at the self-dual thing, which is the fact that the probability is exactly balanced, if you want, for crossing probabilities. And that then, if the, the, the hard part is this sharp threshold, once you have it, this is an exercise, as I heard the people in other talks saying exercise. So this is an exercise. This is not a very difficult exercise to conclude from there. It's a difficult exercise, at least for me, it was a difficult exercise to prove the sharp threshold. Okay? So do not try the, the sharp threshold, except if you are forced to. And, um... Okay. So I'm not going to give you more details because I kind of want to tell you a little bit about the baxter vu connection, and time is flying, so let's turn to the connection, so it's the third part of the talk, the connection be between the six vertex model and FK percolation. So from FK to the baxter -Vu. So what we are going to do is we are going to apply a sequence, in fact, of mappings. And you are going to see, we already saw some of them, a sequence of mapping which is going to go from FK percolation to, to baxter -Vu. So remember that we work, remember that we work on, so six vertex is defined. on a torus, okay? So first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to ask you for a little bit of flexibility in the sense that this is not this. The square lattice on which I'm going to define the FK percolation is not this square lattice here. Okay, it's going to be a rotated version of the square lattice and rescale. So it's going to be this lattice. So FK percolation is going to be defined on this rotated torus. Okay. And here, in order to reuse kind of the drawing I'm, I'm doing here, I'm also going to look at the dual lattice, which is going to be this lattice. Okay, so I'm going to connect FK percolation on the yellow lattice and six vertex model on the white. Okay, I'm going to do that in three steps. So first step, from FK to a loop model. So I'm going to define the model of loops on a certain lattice, in fact, on the white lattice. OK? And I'm going to do this as follows. So imagine I have my lattice like that. 
and my dual lattice. So, and assume that you give yourself omega on the yellow lattice. I want to define a loop configuration as follows. So imagine you have omega. Let's, let me make a, a drawing like that. Let's say this is omega. Remember, I can define omega star on the green lattice. So here I have an isolated vertex. Here it does like that. And here I have this, right? I'm not drawing everything, of course, but this is omega star. I'm going to define now omega. So how did I denote it? Omega loop, I think. Omega loop on the white lattice, this lattice, and I'm going to define it as follows. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to follow the white lattice, and I'm going to turn every time I would bounce on an edge. This is a difficult part of the talk for me because it's not a very easy thing to draw. So I just, you see the white guys are actually on the original lattice, white, and they just bounce every single time they would cross an edge. Is it clear? I'm pretty sure it's not, but I mean, okay, <laughs> I'm not redrawing that. So I define omega on the, as a loop configuration, where loops are such that they do not, that they never cross edges in omega or omega star. Okay? So this is omega loop. And one nice observation is that when p is equal to p self dual, so when P is equal to P self dual, then the probability, so on, on the green lattice, well, uh, sorry, the, the probability on TNM of omega loop, well, is easily expressible, is equal to one over a constant. times square root q to the number of loops in omega zero. So where L of L of omega zero is the number of loops in omega zero. So how do I see that? Well, it's a little bit a game like for the duality. What I'm going to do, I'm going to just compute probability of TNM of omega zero squared. Okay, this is just to be practical. So the probability of omega zero, exactly like omega star was in bijection with omega, omega zero is in bijection with omega and omega star. So the probability of omega zero is the same as the probability of omega, which is the same as the probability of omega star. So I can write this as probability of omega times probability of omega star. I just use one to connect to omega and one to omega star. And this, we know that it's one over a constant, and that this is p over 1 minus p to the number 
of elements in, in uh, omega times q to the number of connected components in omega. And here it's p star over 1 minus p star to the number of edges in omega star times q to the number of connected components in omega star. Right? I just expressed the, the thing using the connection, I mean, using the definition of the probabilities. But notice that p star over 1 plus p star, so, sorry, so p star, yeah, p star over 1 plus p star, what did I do? Ah, yes, yes, sorry. So p over 1 minus p and p star over 1 minus p star, they are equal at the self-dual point because p is equal to p star. But that gives me p self-dual over 1 plus p, uh, 1 minus p self-dual to the power omega plus omega star. But this omega plus omega star is constant. So this whole thing is just a constant, and I end up with q to the number of connected components in omega plus connected components in omega star, and this thing is just the number of loops, in fact. OK. So that was first step. I rewrote, if you want, I'm, I'm now going to forget about omega and omega star and just think of omega loop. Okay? And I have, I mean, you will be uh, agreeing with me, a fairly nice um, formula so, for me. Sorry, yeah? there is a question on the chat, whether it's uh, 1 over z square. I guess it does, doesn't matter, right? Yeah, it, does, it doesn't matter, yeah. So, I mean, indeed, here I could have put one over z star, if you want another, uh, uh, another uh, renormalization constant, it would be fine. In fact, I'm cheating, but I'm really mildly cheating because on the torus, the torus is not a planar graph. So actually the duality is wrong there. But it's up to a topological uh, uh, quantity, it's right, and if, if you tune the, the topological quantity here, you end up with the right result. But I mean, I have only 10 minutes left, so I'm going to allow myself this small cheating, which is not important overall. I mean, at the end, it's not important. So that was step one. Step two now. Step two is from a loop, from loop model to oriented loops. And here, I'm going to do something which is not probabilistic anymore, which is that I'm going to define the weight of an oriented loop configuration. So what is an oriented loop configuration? It's a loop configuration, and every loop, you give it either a clockwise or counterclockwise orientation. So the weight of omega uh, oriented is going to be the definition e to the 2i pi nu times number of loops oriented clockwise minus number of loops oriented counterclockwise. So for now, there is no connection with what I uh, did before. Uh, is a number of loops. Loops oriented clockwise. Counterclockwise. Okay? So I define this, and now I observe the following, and I define, so, sorry, a second thing, I define pi to be a projection. From oriented loops loop configuration to loop configuration, which just consists in forgetting the orientation. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, many oriented loop configuration lead to the same one, it's a projection. And now, Exactly like for the first step, 
I kind of had something to prove. Here, I'm also going to prove something. And what I'm going to prove is that square root q to the number of loops in omega 0 is equal to what? It's equal to the sum of the omega oriented such that pi of omega oriented is equal to omega 0, uh, to omega loop, of the weight of omega oriented. OK? Oh, I didn't tell you what uh, if 2 cos 2 pi mu is equal to square root q. And why is this thing true? Well, it's very simple to see. It's just that every loop can receive two possible orientations, clockwise or counterclockwise. So its weight is going to be either e to the 2 i pi, I mean, its contribution, if you want, to the weight is going to be either e to the 2 i pi mu or e to the minus 2 i pi mu. So when you sum, you get cos, I mean, twice the cost of 2 pi pi mu, so if you, uh, two, 2 pi mu, sorry. So if you set this to be square root q, you are going to recover the square root q to the number of loops. OK? Very good. I'm going to let this space here, because I'm going to come back to this. Don't shoot at the messenger if you saw something uh, that you don't like. Because I will modify slightly everything I said, but I want first to give you the main idea and then to explain to you how you modify. And so now we are finally ready to go from step three, which is from oriented loop to six vertex. Step three. From oriented loops. to six vertex model. OK. Uh, yeah, I realize that here I should have put in big uh, red, but I don't have red. Let's put it in yellow. Uh, we are, it's, it's I use this here, sorry. So I'm only looking at the critical FK percolation if you want only at P equal P self dual, OK? Uh, so now I switch back to this. So from oriented loops to six vertex model. So what I just do is that I forget the loops. So from omega oriented loop, simply forget the loop. to get omega, uh, I mean, an orientation of every edge, OK? And by the way, I'm going to define maybe uh, rho to be the projection from omega to omega oriented loop, uh, from omega oriented loop, sorry, to omega, which consists in simply forgetting the loops. And the last result of the, pa of, uh, the paper, sorry, <laughs> of the class is going to be that if I take the weight of the six vertex model, so if I take um, the sum on omega such that rho of omega is a certain oriented loop configuration of W of omega oriented loop, I end up actually with 1 to the n1 plus n2 1 to the n3 plus n4, and c to the n5 plus n6, where c is equal to uh, 2 cos pi mu. And let me just tell you that in one minute. And that's good, because that's what I have left. So how do you get this? Notice that so they are, if I take a vertex, there are eight possible oriented loop configuration nearby the guy. Either my two loops are doing like that, or they are doing like that. Maybe they do like that. Uh, what am I doing? No, sorry, that's not what I meant. Uh, 
So the other possibility is that they are doing like that. Otherwise, they could do like that. Or like that. Okay. And then I have two more, which are when they are oriented in opposite directions. Decidément, as we say in French. And the last two are like that. Until the end. So these are the eight possible configurations around the vertex. And if you think about the corresponding orientation of loops, here you end up with the first and the second type of orientation. Then here on the sixth, uh, on the fourth and uh, third and fourth. So, I mean, sorry, I'm going to finish because it's uh, was like that. And like that. Did I write even one right in the first place? I don't think, right? I, I have failed with all of them. OK, and then oh, this one was right. So I had one, right? So it's like that. Here, it's going to give you the same one. And here, it's the last one you want, which is this one. So you recover the six possible orientations. And what you notice is that this weight here, the, the weight e to the 2i pi mu number of loops going clockwise minus number of loops going counterclockwise, you can also write it, and then I will be done. You can also write it as a product, I mean, as e to the i pi mu over 2 times number of left turns minus number of right turns. Because any loop it has a 2 pi winding or a minus 2 pi winding, so you can decompose, if you want, the whole e to the 2 i pi mu as just a product of the left and right turns. But then if you write it like that, you see that here there is one left turn and one right turn, so the contribution to this weight is going to be 1. Same thing here, here and here. And here, you have two configurations, either two left turns or two right turns. I mean, two right turns or two left turns. So the contribution is going to be this. And here, same thing is going to be the same thing, which gives you this thing. I am realizing I'm going too fast, but I mean, since I'm already over time, I have to, uh, to wrap things up. So, by using this, I let you leave it to you as an exercise to check you get almost the right thing. The only problem is that you are on a torus and there are non-contractible loops, which don't have winding 2 pi or minus 2 pi when you go around. So I let you think about how you modify this to get from six vertex to a slightly modified random uh, 14 Castellan percolation. But this is way good enough for all applications. And let me mention one application which is that the six vertex model is a very integrable system, as I said, and it's easy to compute its free energy. So one over n times m times the log of the partition function, how fast the partition function grows. Well, this partition function by these mappings is actually equal by a, to a very simple version of the partition function of random cluster uh, 14 castellan percolation and POTS model. So it allows you to compute the free energy at criticality of FK percolation and POTS model. Thank you very much and sorry for uh, going over time. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, there is a question online. Is there an underlying mechanism connecting different models at criticality? Sorry, sorry. Is there, is there an underlying mechanism connecting different models at criticality? So all these models are at criticality. So that's, that was basically the content of, of the class to connect these guys at criticality. And then of, you, you, you can deduce from the critical behavior of one system the critical behavior of the others using these, these mappings. Okay, thank you. Any questions here in the room?
Yes, so my question is about uh, big values of Q. Uh, so the equation to the, uh, the value of mu can be complex, right? If yes, Q... it's going to be complex for Q larger than 4. OK, yeah. but is, it, is then the, um, the law on the six vertex a, a real probability law? Because it's, the it's already, So the mapping itself goes through complex numbers, okay. but ends up from a probabilistic model to another probabilistic model. In fact, when Q is larger than 4, as you uh, notice, mu is purely imaginary. And in fact, all your mappings only involve numbers and not complex numbers. And what I wanted to do, but clearly didn't have time to do, is to explain that in this special case, it's really like probabilistic mappings. And in particular, you can use these probabilistic mappings to prove that the FK percolation, when Q is larger than 4, is undergoing a discontinuous phase transition. While for Q smaller or equal to 4, it's undergoing a continuous one. So you see actually through the fact that mu is purely imaginary or real, you actually see two classes of FK percolation, Q smaller than 4, Q larger than 4. And these two types of models have completely different critical behavior. So it's kind of funny that you see it by numerology in some sense in the, uh, in the, set, of, uh, the, the set of definition of the mu. Thank you. More, more questions here in the room or online? If not, let's give a huge applause to Hugo for his mini course. Thanks again and we resume in about five minutes.